first part of this series that we have entitled Emmanuel. And this series is specifically designed for us to understand what it means to have God with us. Because many of us don't recognize, and this is the first point of our, of our message, so I hope you've taken out your note sheet. God created us to live in his presence. When you look at Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, you see God being very integral in not only creating and forming the world, but in establishing a relationship with humanity. And so Adam and Eve experienced what no other humans had experienced. They experienced the closeness and the intimacy of living in God's presence. They were so connected to God's presence that God walked with them in the garden and talked with them, and they had fellowship on a regular basis in the garden until they disobeyed. In the moment that Adam and Eve disobeyed, it severed that close relationship that God desired to have with his children. And so right after they had disobeyed God and eaten from the forbidden fruit, the Bible says that they went and they hid. Look at how God, the Bible describes God's relationship to uh, the, the, the humans and humanity, Adam and Eve, as they were moving around in the garden. The Bible says, and they heard the sound of the Lord. Adam and Eve were afraid. They know they disappointed God. They had disobeyed what he told them to do. They went and tried to hide, but God came to meet them in the garden like he always had. But now, when they heard his sound, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they hid themselves. Look what they hid themselves from. The presence of the Lord. The one thing that God desired for his people, they forfeit because of disobedience. And I want to challenge us because when you want to know what's the big deal about ignoring what God wants you to do for your life and doing what you want to do for your life, what's at stake is his presence. That's what's priceless. Because the moment that we disobey God, we sever the tie. We cut off the presence. And then we're left to handle life all by ourselves. And that's what Adam and Eve experienced. Adam and Eve experienced that they had God's fellowship. They would enjoy spending time with him in the garden. They would enjoy when they heard his footsteps and they knew, here comes our father. And they would enjoy that time of communion with him. But once they disobeyed God and they were cut off, the Bible says they hid themselves from his presence. And you know, that was the state of humanity from Adam and Eve throughout the rest of the Bible. They were trying to get into his presence. But they weren't successful. Select men in the Bible and women in the Bible were able to experience God's presence. But it wasn't available to everybody. And so here's what the Bible says about Noah. The Bible says that Noah lived such a good life that he walked in close Fellowship with God. What a testimony. Not that he was so intellectual, not that he was so intelligent, not that he was so affable, friendly, but that what distinguished Noah was that he had a close fellowship. That's the same word as communion, relationship with God. And that's what God desires. And if we're going to get the fullness out of this season that we call Advent, God is asking us to reawaken our awareness of his presence and then expect his presence. To live in such expectation that wherever you are, whatever you do, you are expecting God's presence to be there. And so here's what God said to Abraham 
Abraham, you you will recall, was living in a foreign land with his family, and God spoke to Abraham and said, you leave there and just go to the place that I'm going to send you. And Abraham, in, in obedience, gets up, follows whatever God tells him to do, and later on in life, God comes to Abram when he is 99 years old. And this is a man who has distinguished himself of being a man of faith and has seen God do some amazing things in his life. But God reminds Abram what is most important above everything else. And so God comes to him and he says, I am El Shaddai, which is simply God Almighty. And here's what God tells Abram. Walk in my presence. God says to Abram, now Abram, Abraham are the same person. God changed his name as he developed as as a man of faith. But as Abram was developing, God says to him, if you want to be distinguished, you have to live your life. Walk in my presence. Now that word uh, presence there actually comes from the Hebrew word panim, which actually talks about my face. So really what God is saying to Abram is not just walk in some general presence, but actually live with me in front of you. In other words, meet with me face to face. That's the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. Not that we just hang out with him a little bit on Sunday morning and then Monday through Saturday we do whatever we want to do and then Sunday we hang out with him again and then Monday through Saturday we make it the best way we can. No, God wants us to live in his face. That's the closeness that God wants to have with us. My, how we've neglected that. We've gotten so busy that our prayer time is nothing more than a drive-by encounter because we want to be able to check off our list. I prayed and I read my Bible. I'm good. Let me go about my day. But God is saying, wherever you go, I want to be there with you. I want to be your God, but you have to commit to walk in my presence, to live in my face, to have a relationship where we can encounter one another face to face. And that's how Abraham started to live his life. So from this point forward, Abram readjusted himself and he began to be a person who sought after God's face. And so at the end of Abraham's life, when he was ready to find a, a wife for his son Isaac, he sends his servant out to his homeland to find a wife for, for Isaac. And the servant is skeptical and is like, they don't know you. You've been gone for so long, and, and they certainly don't know me. How, am I, how in the world am I going to be successful? How am I going to go and bring back your, your, uh, your son, uh, a wife? How can I do that, Abraham? And here's what Abraham says to him. Abraham says, the Lord, in whose presence I've lived. What a powerful testimony. Abraham says, listen. The God in whose presence I've lived, that God is going to send his angel with you and will make your mission successful. Abram says, I I know you're going to be successful because the same God that I have a real relationship with, the same God in whose face I stay, that God is going to send an angel with you So that wherever you go, you're going to be successful. And I'm wondering, parents, maybe one of our challenges for our children as they're growing and developing into the people we're believing God for them to be, rather than the the tact that many of us take, including me, mostly me, of trying to constantly direct them and challenge them and nag them, maybe part of what we need to do is get back in his presence and then call on his presence to go out and do the work in their lives so that they can have an authentic relationship with God just like you do. So maybe the part isn't for us to uh, focus on the doing so much it is is, uh, uh, focus on the being in his presence because in his presence then he can do everything that needs to be done. I'm calling us as a church 
to revive our hunger and thirst for God's presence. Because part of what we've done is we've settled for omnipresence, but God desires manifest presence. That's what we've done. We've settled for God's omnipresence, and we've neglected the manifest presence of God. Let me give you some definitions here. Omnipresence is an attribute of God who is everywhere all the time. Omni, all, presence, presence. So all present. He's always present. And that's true. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. So everywhere you go on this earth, God is there. But that's just one aspect of who he is. And so, yes, God is with us here. God is with you in your house. God is with you all around. But there is a difference from being in someone's presence and experiencing someone's presence. So we can't get away from the fact that God is everywhere. In fact, that's what David said. David said, where shall I go from your spirit and where shall I flee from your presence? I can't. Wherever I go, God's going to be there. But there's a difference. Okay, married people, you all probably don't ever have this situation. But if you've ever been upset with your spouse and they pushed you to that certain point where you don't want to talk to them, you don't even want to see them, you two can be in the same house. You're both present, but you're not experiencing each other's presence. You can be in the same bed and still not be talking. You're present, but you're not experiencing each other's presence. And I think that's really how we treat God. We know he's everywhere. Oh, God, I know you're here. And what we do is we take him for granted. And the most precious thing that God has for us is his presence. And so that's why God calls us not to just recognize his omnipresence, but to seek after, to expect his manifest presence. His manifest presence occurs in communion that causes an experience. Manifest presence makes God's presence known so that it is not just theoretical, I serve an invisible God, but it becomes experiential. I know there is a God because I met with him face to face this morning. And you can never try to argue me away from believing in God because I have had my own experience with him and I know that he's real and I don't need a book. I don't need a theology. I don't need three points. All I need to know is I can get in his presence and he can make himself known to me. And so when God was challenging Moses to take the children of Israel into the promised land, Moses had had a a real challenging time trying to lead the children of Israel. Every time God blessed them, they turned and did the opposite thing. Moses was kind of tired, and God says, okay, Moses, it's time to take the children of Israel into the promised land. And Moses said, hold up. Now, if you want me to go into the promised land and take them with me, I can't do it unless your presence goes with me. Look at it in the Bible in Exodus chapter 33. It's so powerful. God responds to Moses' protest and says, my presence will go with you. Man, that's that's what we we ought to desire. God, I desire that your presence go with me everywhere I go. And I will give you rest. See, when his presence is with you, It'll calm everything down around you. Because when you are enveloped in his presence, then his almightiness is not just theory. You now have experienced it for yourself. When you call him your healer, it's not just theoretically, yes, he is a healer, 
when you have experienced his presence, he becomes my healer. He's not just a heavenly father theoretically, theologically, but he now is my father. And I know him for myself. And we've missed this. We've gotten so busy. We're running and we're racing. Oh, we're saying our declarations daily and we're reading our Bible and we're, we're almost, we're in the book of Revelation now because we're doing the one-year Bible. And so we can say this year we read the Bible through and we prayed on a regular basis, but we've missed his presence. And that's what God wants us to rediscover, not just for this season, but for the rest of our lives, a dependence on his presence. And so here's what uh, Moses says at when God says, I'm going to be with you. He said, all right, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. In other words, I don't want to leave this place unless your presence goes with me. And what a powerful prayer that would be to pray before you left your house in the morning. Not just you had a good time with God in prayer, but God, I don't want to get in this car unless I know you're with me. I don't want to go to this job unless I know you're with me. I don't want to even go to the store unless I know you're with me. God, I don't want to go into this meeting unless I know that you're with me. Because I don't want to live my life void of your presence. And so we're talking about, in order to, get to experience the manifest presence of God, it requires communion. It requires fellowship with God. That word communion means this sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings. I can't have communion with God if it's a one-way street. If all I do is just sit down and say, God, I need a car, I need a house, I need some Christmas presents, God, I need more money, God, I need a, job, a better job, God, I need to be healed, God, I need you to take care of my kids, God, I need you to do this for me, God, I need you to do okay, peace, gotcha, God, I'm gone. That's not communion. That's not even a dialogue. God desires communion with us so that when we come into his presence, yeah, you share with what's on your heart, but the time is not over until God shares what's on his heart. You don't want to end your prayer time unless you've given God a chance to respond with his presence. Amen? And that's what we have to recognize that this Christmas season is all about. This Christmas season is about understanding that God did not want to be separated from us, but God actually wants to be in relationship with us. Now, we get very excited about the fact that Jesus died to save our sins, and God sent him into the world to be the Savior of the world. And yes, he did all of that, but he did that for a reason. He did not just get rid of sin so that we could have a clear conscience. No, he got rid of sin because sin and disobedience is a barrier to his presence. So he had to deal with sin because he wanted us to sit at his table. We can't sit at his table and be in fellowship with him with sin in our lives. So that's why he sent Jesus. Yes, he's the savior of the world. Yes, he forgives all of our sins, but that's not the best part. The best part is I now can have access to his presence. That's why when the angel was talking to Mary about uh, giving birth to a savior, she lets us know, yeah, he's going to save his people from his sins. But behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's the key. God wants to be with you, not just in church. God wants to be with you, not just in your prayer time, but God wants to be with you 
each and every moment of each and every day. And if you will open yourself up to him and expect him to meet you every place you go, you'll walk into a deeper dimension of who he is and you will walk in a power. You'll walk in a peace. You'll walk in a joy that you've never experienced before because all of that comes from, flows forth from his presence. So my prayer for you, my prayer for you, is that you will hunger after his presence. I don't care where I am, in the valley or on the mountaintop, I want his presence. I don't care if I'm on a hospital bed or sitting in a funeral home saying goodbye to a loved one. I need his presence. I don't know if I'm in the unemployment line or if I'm sitting in the bank while they're telling me they're going to take my house. I need his presence. I don't care if I'm standing in my garage watching them repossess my car. I need his presence. I don't care if people walk out of my life. I need his presence. I don't care if things take a reversal on me. I need his presence. Because if everything else is taken away from me and all I've got left is his presence, that's enough because I can make it from there. So my challenge to you is to expect that God's presence will meet you every day. Not just today on Sunday. Man, we had a wonderful time of worship. But I want to meet him just like that tomorrow morning. And when I take a break at lunch tomorrow, I want to meet him just like that. And when I'm feeling despondent and feeling overwhelmed by life, I want to be able to slip away and meet him just like that. Because I want his presence, I depend on his presence, and I can't live without his presence. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed.